sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Click on the link in the description and enter promo code UNDECIDED for 85% off and three extra months for free. If you're watching this video, that means you obviously have an internet connection. Although you may live in an area with limited providers or network speeds, you still have internet accessibility, which can improve everything from entertainment to work to education and to healthcare. But 41.3% of the world doesn't have access to internet at all. And that's where SpaceX comes in with Starlink, which is getting very close to launching their own service. What is it? What are the latest developments? And why should you even care? I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Decided. So as I mentioned, internet access isn't ubiquitous. Just over 40% of the world doesn't have any access to the internet yet. And even in areas with access, it can be spotty if you're not in a more urban area. Places like Africa, the Middle East, and Asia are lagging behind areas like North America and Europe. Laying long cable runs into remote regions can be costly given the number of potential customers. Even building out wireless signals in those areas is costly, which is why there are still so many low bandwidth areas in places across the United States. While 96% of urban areas have access to broadband, only 61% of rural areas do. Satellite internet service solves part of that problem because you can cover a large area with a single satellite, but there are some big downsides. Current satellite-based internet services are using geostationary satellites that are orbiting at over 35,000 kilometers, or about 22,000 miles, above the surface of the Earth. It's that distance that creates the first major problem, latency. A radio signal takes about 120 milliseconds to reach a geostationary satellite, with another 120 milliseconds to relay that signal back down to the ground. So in theory, you'd be looking at at least 240 milliseconds. But in practice, you often see a round trip latency between 400 and 600 milliseconds, 12 times slower than what you see on the ground. And then you have the challenge of how much bandwidth a single satellite can handle at once, which can affect the download and the upload speeds for everyone sharing that satellite. That means your maximum upload and download speeds will be likely on the lower side, and you'll have some data caps to contend with each month. Viasat and HughesNet are two of the options that you have available today, and they cost between $30 and $150 a month for speeds between 12 and 100 megabits per second. And Viasat's current throughput in their satellites is about 260 gigabits per second, which is shared by everybody using it. What this means is that there's a huge opening for competition, and that's where SpaceX comes in with Starlink. Since we already have satellite internet, what makes Starlink different? It's a low Earth orbit constellation of satellites that operate around one third to one one hundredth the height of geostationary satellites. As of April 22nd, 2020, there are 422 satellites in the Starlink constellation so far, with most of them deployed at around 550 kilometers or 340 miles. They're trying to launch 60 satellites per Falcon 9 flight for a total of around 4,400 satellites in phase one and they'll add another 7,500 in phase two. So around the year 2027, they'll have nearly 12,000 satellites deployed in three orbital shells. Now it's not guaranteed, but SpaceX has also submitted paperwork for an additional 30,000 satellites beyond that. So why so many satellites? Well, low Earth orbit satellites being much closer to the Earth means they can't be stationary. They have to move faster to maintain their orbit, and they will also have a smaller cone of coverage. But a big benefit of being so much closer is a much lower latency for communication. You'll have latencies around 25 to 35 milliseconds, which makes it comparable to cable and fiber optic networks. However, when using lasers to communicate between satellites, which Starlink will eventually do, it gets a little physics boost. Light travels through a vacuum about 47% faster than through glass, like a fiber optic cable. So even when accounting for transmitting from the planet and back, the faster laser transmission speeds between the satellites will give the network a latency edge compared to long stretches of fiber on Earth. And each satellite will be able to handle one terabit per second, which is almost four times the capacity of Viasat. That's roughly 40,000 people streaming 4K video at once. While all of that sounds incredible, this isn't a service that's meant to knock out terrestrial internet services. It's a service meant for a smaller segment of the market, which is primarily areas less densely populated. Just this past March, Elon talked about just that at the Satellite 2020 conference. The, the challenge for anything that is uh, space-based is that the, the size of the cell is gigantic. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's, like I said, it's great for, for uh, very low to maybe, maybe medium s uh, sort of sparsity situations, but it's not, uh, it's not good for high-density situations. We'll, we'll have some 
small number of customers in LA, but we, we can't do a lot of customers in LA because the bandwidth per cell is, is simply not uh, high enough. With tens of thousands of satellites being put into orbit, it's going to dwarf everything that's come before. At this point in our history, we've only launched about 9,000 objects into space. And of those, a little less than 6,000 are still in use today. SpaceX is going to triple that number in five to seven years. And if they move forward with the additional 30,000, you can probably understand why a lot of people are concerned about overcrowding and space debris. If you've ever seen the movie Gravity, then you probably know about the Kessler Syndrome. It's the theory that an object colliding with another in a densely packed area of space could cause a cascade of destruction. The FCC required very strict plans from SpaceX to mitigate space debris, which meant achieving a higher level of deorbiting reliability than NASA uses for itself. That's 90% of satellites reliably deorbiting. With a targeted lifespan of five to seven years, SpaceX told the FCC that it will implement an operations plan for the orderly deorbit of satellites nearing the end of their useful lives at a rate far faster than is required under international standards, and that SpaceX satellites will deorbit by propulsively moving to a disposal orbit from which they will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere within approximately one year after completion of their mission. About 95% of the satellite's parts will disintegrate in the Earth's atmosphere as they deorbit. There's also been concerns about the impact on astronomical observations. With the satellites being very visible when they're deployed and also noticeable as they're tumbling their way to their final orbit, astronomers are worried about the light pollution. SpaceX has been working with astronomers to address these concerns with strategies like painting sections of the newer satellites black to reduce the reflection, or adjusting their orbit orientation to minimize how the satellite will catch and reflect sunlight towards the surface of the Earth during their orbit, and even adding a sunshade to the satellite to help block reflections. They're calling it VisorSat. There's still a lot of outstanding questions about how this will ultimately impact visual and radio telescope observations, but SpaceX is actively trying to address them. And SpaceX isn't the only company working on low Earth orbit constellations for internet service. Companies like Telesat, OneWeb, and Amazon all have plans, but nobody has successfully launched a business out of this. Amazon is working on Project Kuiper, which will have around 3,200 satellites, but has yet to put any satellites into orbit. And OneWeb, which launched 74 satellites, just filed for bankruptcy in March of 2020. I mean, it's real important to just set the stage here for LEO communications constellations. Guess how many uh, LEO constellations uh, didn't go bankrupt? Mm -hmm. Zero. Right. Zero. Mm -hmm. um, Iridium is doing okay now, but the Iridium One went bankrupt. Orbcom went bankrupt. Um, Global Star bankrupt. Teledesic bankrupt. Am I leaving anyone out? There's a bunch of others that didn't get very far. They also went bankrupt. Anyway, they all went bankrupt. <laughs> so you're focusing on making it work first. Uh, for, not bankrupt. There's a huge business opportunity here for the company that can get up and running first, which is obviously looking like it's SpaceX. In 2018, they estimated the total cost would be about $10 billion, which is a lofty price tag for a company that's only expected to make three to $5 billion a year from launches by 2025. The projections for yearly revenue from Starlink are 30 to $50 billion a year by 2025. But that's a means to an end for Elon and SpaceX. In a media call before the launch of the very first Starlink satellites, Elon said, we see this as a way for SpaceX to generate revenue that can be used to develop more and more advanced rockets and spaceships. We believe we can use the revenue from Starlink to fund Starship, which leads right into their goal for becoming a multi-planetary species. There are really two fundamental paths. History is gonna bifurcate along two directions. One, one, one path is we stay on Earth forever, um, and then there will be some eventual extinction event. Um, I don't have an immediate doomsday prophecy, but there's, it's eventually history suggests there will be some, some doomsday event. Uh, the alternative is to become a space-faring civilization and a multi-planet species, which uh, I hope you would agree that is the right way to go. Yes? <laughs> Back on Earth, we're not gonna have to wait too much longer to see Starlink in action. But before I get to when Starlink is actually going to be available, it's a good time to talk about getting a VPN for your internet, whether it's terrestrial or space-based. I'd like to thank Surfshark for sponsoring this video. I always use a VPN when traveling and using free Wi-Fi in airports and hotels, but that's not the only reason to use one. 
Surfshark encrypts all of the data that you send over the internet so your private data like passwords, messages, photos, videos, or whatever you're doing online stays private. That means you can protect your online identity from tracking and commercial targeting that we see with so many services today. With Surfshark's clean web, it will block ads, trackers, and malicious websites, making it safer to use the internet, even at home. One of the best parts of Surfshark is that it's easy to set up on all your devices, whether that's an iPhone or Android, Mac or PC. Surfshark is the only VPN to offer one account to use with an unlimited number of devices. Use my code to get 85% off plus three extra months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out for yourself. Link in the description below, and thanks to Surfshark and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now, the private beta service is scheduled to start in northern U.S. and Canada around August of 2020, with a public beta following up in November of 2020. Part of the reason for the limited scope is due to where the current satellites are orbiting. As more satellites join the constellation, we'll see more areas rolled into the beta program. It's going to be interesting to see how well the system performs over the next year or two, and what opportunities it opens up for mobility, internet access, and other businesses. Areas that have no or poor internet availability will benefit the most from Starlink, but so will areas that lack competition. And if this proves out to be as low latency as promised, it could be a huge moneymaker for high-frequency stock traders. It's not just gamers that benefit from low latency. Starlink's projected 25 to 35 millisecond latency is faster than anything stock traders have available today between major trading centers in the US and Europe. In businesses where every millisecond counts, Starlink could mean big business. Now, if you like this video, be sure to check out my video on EV charging. Even if you're already familiar with EVs, I cover some aspects of how charging works and what it means for our electric grid. Now jump into the comments and let me know what you think about Starlink. And as always, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.